Hello everybody, my name is Laura Volian and I'm an undergraduate student at the Lucian Blaga University of Sibiu studying conservation and restoration. Today I will talk about the identification of photographic processes. I will present how I do this and I will apply some key steps for three case studies. Before I start, I would like to mention and thank my mentor, lecturer Marta Gundman who encouraged and guided me in preparing this presentation. I'm also very grateful to Gaywin Weaver, who offered me a scholarship this spring to attend his seven weeks online course about the care and identification of photographs from the 5th of February to the 4th of April. Everything I've learned here, I've applied in a summer internship at Turgu Muresh, so I also want to thank the Lecky Boyle Library and Moorish County Museum for letting me exercise these skills on their collections. As you can see, the workshop covered a lot of subjects, starting from the history of photography and continuing with different photographic processes. The photomechanical processes were also discussed, as well as the color and digital prints. In the last weeks, We've learned more about the preservation environment and how to store and handle photographic materials. In my presentation though, I will only refer to the identification of the silver-based black and white processes. So why is identification so important? Well, other than better knowing your collection, you can also think about some more practical benefits like knowing which storage materials to choose, how to handle this type of object, and in what environmental conditions you should keep them in. More than that, you don't even need expensive equipment. The tool that I use all the time is this little handheld microscope that I received in the kit offered by the course, but you can find a similar one on Amazon for only 10 pounds. In fact, I made all the magnification photos in this presentation using it and my smartphone camera. Other options could be a digital microscope or a basic stereo microscope. Using the identification chart created by Gawin makes the entire process very easy and you can download it from his website for free as well as other very useful resources. I will explain how I use this chart in the following slides, but first I want to mention other useful tools like the reference prints. You can exercise your identification skills on them and you can always compare their characteristics with the ones of the print you try to identify. Mine are from the sample set I've received from the course, but you can also buy one from Gwin's website. To some extent, the online platform Graphic Atlas can replace them. Here you can read about all the processes used in the past and compare different techniques. By selecting two different processes on each side, you can analyze them using the navigation tool. In this way, you can change the side of the prints, their orientation, the light source and the level of magnification. Last but not least, you should always work on a clean surface and prevent touching the image layer. So it is strongly recommended to wear gloves. It's also preferable to take notes using a graphic pencil to prevent possible ink accidents. In the followings, I will present you the basic steps of the identification process. The first one would be a thorough visual examination. Just by looking at the photograph on both sides, we can identify important details, sometimes even the date when the photograph was taken. It's also helpful to look at the format of the photograph. Is it a card de visite or a cabinet card? Maybe it's mounted or not. The format of the photograph and the way how it is mounted tend to be typical for certain periods. But of course, that also depends on the provenience country. Knowing when the print was made can really narrow the options because each process is specific for a certain period, as you can already see on the chart. However, this is not enough. 
So the next thing to look after is the image color. And when we say that, we refer to the dark part of the photograph. However, we should always keep in mind that the color of the image may vary depending on the chemical substances used for developing or toning. Also, it can differ regarding how deteriorated the print is, but we should not mistake yellowing as the image color. On the chart, the photographic processes are divided into two rows depending on their color. On the first are the more reddish purplish brown prints and on the second the ones with a more neutral black or brown color. Next we will analyze the surface of the image to decide if it's velvety matte, semi-matte, semi-glass or glossy. And then we will look at the photograph throughout the microscope. In this way we can determine if the paper fibers are visible or not. If not, maybe we can see the barita layer or the matting agents. Sometimes we can discover an interesting pattern that shows the print is not even a photograph but the result of a photomechanical process. Photomechanical prints are a production of photographic images and they were never light sensitive. The example presented in the last circle is a color type. But other photomechanical processes are photogravures, rotogravures, letterpress, halftones, and offset lithographs. By considering the image surface and by looking under magnification, we can better understand the structure of the print and locate the process in one of the three columns from the chart. Now we should have an idea about what process was used to make the photograph by narrowing our options to only one. But if we still are unsure, we can examine if there are any deteriorations. Here are some examples of fading, abrasion, yellow discoloration, and silver mirroring. Some of them are representative for certain processes, and you can find them in each section of the chart. So these are the key steps I followed in the next case studies. The first one is a print belonging to the Teleki Boyoi library. This is an image of what it looks like a dead person. According to the librarians, he is Farkas Boyoi, an important Transylvanian mathematician who lived between 1775 and 1856. This is quite an important aspect because there were only two possible processes in that time. Salted print, one of the first photographic processes, and albumin print, which only started to be used in 1851. We can also see that the photograph is faded and in the past someone even drawn it to accentuate the features of the face. By looking at the print we can see that the image color is reddish brown, so we should only look at the first row of the chart. The surface of the image is velvety matte and this will indicate a process that is on the first column. That can be confirmed by looking under magnification and in this case we can clearly see the paper fibers. All these characteristics can only indicate one process and that is solid paper. I must add that this is quite a rare photograph given the fact that there aren't so many salted prints. That's because the garotypes were more common between 1840 and 1860. Maybe this is the reason someone misidentified it in the past as being a daguerreotype. However, this wouldn't be possible because the daguerreotypes were made on silver copper plates. This print was protected by a great enclosure and stored in optimal environmental conditions. So my only re recommendation was to change the label of the displayed copy from the daguerreotype to salted paper. The second case study is from Muresh County Museum and it's a small image of a soldier from the First World War, as the year written on the back says, 1917. The small size and the dark edges show it was printed using a contact printing frame. This means the negative was in contact with the paper and exposed to the sunlight. This is called a printing out process or 
P-O-P. Other features we can observe are the reddish brown color, the glossy surface, and the fact that the paper fibers are invisible. We can also see that the print is faded and discolored, especially at the edges. But in this case, we might be a little confused because both gelatin POP and collodion POP seem to be similar regarding their color, surface and non-visible paper fibers. The one thing that differentiates them is how they deteriorate over time. In the case of gelatin POP, the specific degradations are fading and discoloration. And in the case of collodion POP, abrasion that easily expresses barita layer. As we already said, this print is faded and discolored, but we can't see the barita layer exposed through our abrasion. So the only possibility that remains is gelatin POP, or in other words, gelatin silver chloride print. In the last case study, we have another small print in the format of a card de visite. On the front side, we can see the person's name and the year when it was made, 1910. On the back, we observe what remains from the studios and photographer's name. From how it looks, we can deduce that this print was once mounted. Regarding its characteristics, this time the color is neutral black, so we will look at the second row of the chart. Observing that this photograph is matte can confuse us, but by looking at the third column, we see that here every level of glassiness is possible. Moreover, the paper fibers are not visible, but we can spot the matting agents instead. Analyzing the degradations, we can remark the abrasions and also some silver mirroring. All these particularities demonstrate that this photograph is a gelatin silver print. Identifying these two photographs from Muresh County Museum helped to complete the database of the photography collection with the description of the processes used. In addition, I recommended a relatively dry, cool and stable environment. This would mean 30-40% relative humidity and a temperature below 18 degrees Celsius. I also suggested protective enclosures made from acid-free lignin-free paper within a box. Now here is the reference list. And before ending the presentation, I would like to add that taking part in this online course was a very useful experience and an important addition to my training in conservation. The course is held again this fall and will be held in spring too. I would encourage everyone interested in this topic to apply. If you have any questions I can answer regarding the course or the information conveyed by it, please feel free to contact me at this email address. Thank you for your kind attention.